Welcome to the Aaron Harbor Show. This is part two of our special two-part series with Ambassador Stuart Eisenstadt talking about his book, Chronicling the Years in the White House with President Jimmy Carter. Stu, thanks for joining me. Thank you, Aaron. It's great having you. Uh, really enjoyed part one. Now we're going to talk about some specifics for part two. Um, you know, I, I'd like to start off with, I think a lot of people, when they look at the Carter presidency, don't have any real... Uh, understanding of what he did to advance women and, and minorities, people of color, uh, during his four years in office. Talk so remember, bit. here's a southern former governor coming from a tiny hamlet, Plains, Georgia, and what does he do? He appoints more women and more African Americans and minorities to federal judgeships and to senior positions than all 38 presidents before him put together. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who I quote in the book in her famous documentary, RBG, says, I would not have been on the Supreme Court had not Jimmy Carter opened the federal courts to women. It's something that he really is uh, not well known for. It was a huge accomplishment. So one of the things that we didn't get to talk about in the, uh, in the first show was his efforts in relation to Middle East peace, to peace in the Middle East. I'd like you to talk about that. That was an extraordinary process uh, that culminated in a tremendous success that I think very few people are even aware of today. So the Middle East peace process had stalled after the breakthroughs that Kissinger and Nixon made with partial withdrawals. So what happens is Sadat makes his historic trip to Jerusalem. Okay, you're talking about, of course, Anwar Sadat, the, Anwar president, Sadat, the of president of Egypt. Anwar Sadat, the president of Egypt, makes his historic trip, says no more wars. But for the next nine months, the negotiations between Israel and Egypt go nowhere. And it looks like Sadat's initiative is going to go up in flames. And this is in 19... 1979. 79, okay. Right. So uh, what happens is... The actual trip he makes is in late 77, late 77. So Carter takes an enormous risk. He sees Sadat's historic trip to Jerusalem in late 77 going up in flames. He invites them to Camp David. Both of them, Menachem Begin. Both Menachem Begin, the, the prime minister, who Israel. was a very hardline, first time a Likud prime minister had been appointed. The Labor Party had been in power for the first 30 years and Anwar Sadat, and tries to bring them The first 30 years together. of Israel's existence. The first 30 years had all been the Labor Party, a more liberal party. Begin brings a new philosophy, the greater Israel. We have everything from the Mediterranean to the Jordan Sea. That was given to us divinely, but it's also something we, we want to develop. So Carter puts the two of them together at Camp David in an enormously risky effort. Contrast what he did with the Singapore summit with North Korea, which was not well prepared. He poured over intelligence reports on them. You, you Aaron, don't think that President Trump poured over intelligence well, reports? Well, it doesn't appear that he did. Uh, what does he do the first of the agonizing 13 days and nights? The first Sunday, he takes Sadat and Begin to nearby Gettysburg Battlefield to symbolically say you fought five wars together, that's enough. And then he drafts 20 draft agreements during that 13 agonizing days and nights. He drafts them. He negotiates separately at Camp David with Begin and Sadat and their aides because they were like two scorpions in a the bottle. They never got together to negotiate except at the beginning. And then at the very end, the last 13th day, the last Sunday, we're close but we're not quite there. And Begin, not bluffing, says, Mr. President, I can't make any more concessions. I'm going home. I have an al, al plane waiting for me at Andrews Air Force Base. I've had it. My bags are packed. Carter realizing the whole Middle East could go in flames. Sadat's historic journey could go up in flames. His own administration could go in flames. Knowing that Menachem Begin loved his eight grandchildren, he personally inscribed photographs for each one by name of a photograph at Camp David of himself, Carter and Begin, takes it to Begin's cabin, hand delivers it, 
sees Bagan read each of their names. Bagan's lips quiver, his eyes tear. He puts his bags down and he says, Mr. President, I'll make one last try. The rest is history. Forty years, the treaty has stayed. They're real allies now against Hamas, against the radicals. This was an incredible accomplishment. It was due to perseverance, to understanding the issues, to writing those drafts, but also the personal element. Gettysburg at the beginning, the grandchildren at the end. It's just amazing. By the way, uh, the odds are, I just realized, you and I were together uh, at the end of that because there was a ceremony, uh, an outdoor ceremony at the White House. There where was, the, under a giant tent. And uh, I was invited to attend that. Uh, and so I got to see Menachem Begin uh, and Anwar Sadat and President Carter. I mean, they were, I wasn't with them. Uh, I just happened to be. Well, I, thought, I was directly there and to see the three of them clasp hands was unbelievably emotional. And may I give another anecdote I mentioned in, in my book, President Carter of the White House Years. We had, we had President Carter and Mrs. Carter over for Passover Seder right after the treaty. Can you imagine? The, this is the Seder talking about the Israelites leaving Egypt and go 40 years into the desert to get to Israel. And here we have the first treaty. And he stayed throughout the entire Seder. It was a really emotional emotional Passover. That's just, just amazing. All right, we're going to take a break. We'll be back with Stu Eisenstadt in just a moment. For information on how to help promote civil and mutually respectful discourse and support expansion of the distribution of our programs, please email info at harbortv.com. I'm Aaron Harbor, host of The Aaron Harbor Show. You can follow the show on Twitter for instant notification of new episodes, live event invitations, outtakes, and behind the scene photos. And tweet us your topic and guest suggestions today. The Rex Al Broadcaster of the Year Award recognizes an individual who through leadership, skill, and dedication is advancing the broadcast industry in our state and our nation. Tonight, we honor Aaron Harbor. Aaron has uh, worked extensively in the media as a host, producer, political and economic commentator and columnist. Today, the Aaron Harbor Show is the focus of his media involvement. Aaron, it is a privilege to present you with the Rex Howe Broadcaster of the Year Award. Congratulations. Just make journalism great again. I'm Aaron Harbour, host of The Aaron Harbour Show. I very much would like to hear from you about the program, so please send me an email with your thoughts. You can suggest what topics I should cover, what guests I should invite to be on the show, or even what specific questions you would like me to ask. This is your program, so send your suggestions to Aaron at HarbourTV.com. I promise to personally read every one, so email me today. And most of all, thanks for watching. Join me and watch the Aaron Harbor Show. 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 I'm Reverend Jesse Jackson. Watch the Aaron Harbor Show and keep hope alive. I'm Aaron Harbor, host of the Aaron Harbor Show. Find us on Facebook to get all the latest updates, see behind the scene photos, and make comments and ask me questions. You can see episodes before their TV broadcast, so like the show today. The Aaron Harbor Show may be viewed 24 7 at no charge from any location in the world at harbortv.com. Welcome back to the show. I'm with Stu Eisenstadt talking about his book and the years he spent at the White House with President Jimmy Carter. So, Stu, we were just talking about the Middle East. I'd like uh, your thoughts on two, two quick things. One is uh, what the ultimate impact politically was for Jimmy Carter in terms of what he did in the Middle East, and also the situation today, uh, which seems worse than ever, and, and I may be wrong about that, but I'd like your assessment of that. And I want your solution. So how do we get uh, a permanent peace in the Middle East, at least as far as Israel is concerned? So I've recently come back 
uh, from a meeting with Prime Minister Netanyahu and the cabinet uh, in my position as co-chairman of the Jewish People's Policy Institute, so I can talk about that. It's ironic, Aaron, that here is a president who brought Israel its first peace agreement with its most powerful Arab enemy, Egypt, who was the father of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, who broke the back of the Arab boycott with the anti-Arab boycott bill of 77, who championed Soviet Jewry, who saved 50,000 Iranian Jews from Ayatollah Khomeini, and yet he gets the smallest percentage of Jewish votes of any Democratic president or candidate in his re-election in 1980. And part of that was because he also championed the Palestinian cause. Even while Yitzhak Rabin was still prime minister and came for his first day visit before Begin was elected. While Rabin was there, Carter calls for a Palestinian homeland, unscripted by the way, we were all shocked about it. He believed very strongly in Palestinian rights and a two-state solution. Now at that time we weren't talking about a Palestinian state, but Palestinian rights. That was not popular. The F-15 fighter jet sales to Saudi Arabia was very unpopular. Even with that, with all of these accomplishments, we won 70 percent of the Jewish vote in the Illinois primary in March, almost knocking Ted Kennedy out of the race. What then happens? Through a miscommunication. This is March of 1980. 1980. What then happens? Going into the New York primary, we were 20 points ahead. Carter, through a miscommunication, the U.S. ambassador to the European Union, McHenry, votes in favor of a resolution condemning Israeli settlements in the West Bank, and Carter did not like the settlements at all. But contrary to Carter's pledge to Begin at Camp David, he said, I may some say something against settlements, I'll not ever include anything on, uh, in Jerusalem. That UN resolution had six references to Jerusalem, and the Jewish community really went off the wall. We had campaign workers coming out of our campaign. We lost the New York primary. Kennedy stayed throughout the whole campaign. The convention was a disaster. It was one of the building blocks to our defeat and one of the reasons we only got 40 percent of the Jewish vote, notwithstanding all these remarkable accomplishments. It's a great irony and a painful one for me. Well, and a good illustration of how you can do 20 good things and, and one single bad one can undo all of them. Exactly. Um, all right, so what should we do about peace in the Middle East today? So I go to Israel two or three times a year. I've probably been there 50 times. Uh, I'm deeply enmeshed in it. I don't think there is a possibility in the near term of a two-state solution. Had Carter been reelected, had what Begin pledged at Camp David and in the treaty between Israel and Egypt, full autonomy for the Palestinians, had that been implemented, I don't think we would have the impasse we do today. But now we have a very weak and divided Palestinian uh, government. We have a very hard line uh, Israeli government. There's no possibility of a two-state solution. So what I've suggested, along with others like Dennis Ross in a recent article that we did for the Washington Post, we call it Plan B. If you can't cure the patient, the Hippocratic Oath says, don't make it worse. So what we would do is limit the growth in settlements to the settlement blocks that under all peace agreements, including the so-called Bill Clinton parameters, would remain with Israel. Don't build deep into the West Bank and foreclose the possibility. Separate the two populations. And second, economic empowerment for the Palestinians. More investment in what's called Area C of the West Bank, where all the mineral and agricultural wealth is. Give them more economic empowerment, more joint ventures with Israeli companies. Uh, during the administration of the Clinton administration, when I was under Secretary of State, I went to Gaza. We passed something called the Qualifying Industrial Zones. It allowed any product with as little as 10 percent Israeli content to come back duty-free from Gaza. It was a beautiful thing to see. Thirty plants employing 1,200 Gazans, not one armed Israeli soldier. Products came in on a truck, went right through the Eretz Passage to a uh, airport in Gaza that we had helped build, all of that ended with the intifada that Arafat caused. All of it was destroyed. So what could, what could we do now in, in that vein? I mean, when you're in Israel, when you're talking to the leadership of Israel, uh, what kind of progress could be made? Or, or is, is the reality that Israel is really 
uh, willing to uh, continue uh, essentially well, the current situation it, ad infinitum? It's a much worse reality at one level and a much better one at the other. It's better because Israel is now, which it wasn't then, a high-tech center. It's attracted foreign investment. It's now have a strategic relationship with the Sunni states, with the Gulf, with Egypt, with Jordan, with Saudi Arabia, against Iran. But from the Palestinian standpoint, there's very little progress. There are more and more settlements. There were 15 to 20,000 settlers during our administration. There are now 350,000. So we have to think. This is Israeli settlers. Israeli settlers in the West Bank. So we have to think very creatively. And I think what that means is that with Hamas, which did not exist during the Carter administration, supported by Iran, sending rockets into Israel, with Hezbollah with 100,000 rockets in Lebanon, again from Iran, poised Israel, with what's happening in Syria, Israel's security has to be the first paramount thing. But at the same time, it's got to make living conditions for the Palestinians more viable, more economic development, less pushing of new settlements into the territories. And there are positive things. We've seen, for example, uh, there's a, a, a Palestinian businessman named Masri, Bashar Masri. He's building a new city in the West Bank, totally modern, 14,000 people. He's against the, anti, the, the boycott movement against Israel. We need to build more leaders like that up. And he was telling us recently when we were at uh, Aspen, uh, that he's having difficulty getting the Israeli government to help him with the infrastructure to make this a success. Now, this should be a no-brainer. There are no political security issues involved. So we need to empower the Palestinians p economically so that we create a more viable environment, ultimately for a peace, but that peace is a long way off, particularly with so much roiling in the Middle East and on Israel's borders from Hamas and Hezbollah and uh, from Syria, and from Iran in Syria. All right, speaking of Iran, uh, uh, President Trump's decision to uh, begin the process to uh, withdraw from the, uh, the nuclear accord, uh, what's your take on that? Well, Iran is, of course, the coup de grace to the Carter presidency, as I mentioned. But now, I'm a hardliner with respect to Iran in terms of its support for terrorism, its missile program. However, for six years I've chaired her in the Iran Task Force for the Atlantic Council, a think tank in Washington. I think it was a serious mistake to withdraw from the what's called JCPOA, the nuclear agreement. That nuclear agreement disabled their plutonium plant. It cut by two-thirds their uranium enrichment from centrifuges. It limited the amount of enriched uranium. And importantly, 24-7 inspection by the International Atomic Energy Agency with cameras at all suspect things. That's all going to be gone. It's a tragedy. I think it's a real mistake. There were imperfections to that agreement. We needed to do more on the terrorism action. But the European Union, and I was ambassador of the European Union during the Clinton administration, was willing to work with the administration on those non-nuclear issues if we had stayed with the nuclear agreement. And, uh, but has, uh, Iran hasn't said that we're abandoning it. Iran hasn't made a decision yet of what to do. Uh, I think they're slowly going to ease out of it, but not overnight. All right, we're going to take our last break. We will be back with Stu Eisenstadt in just a moment. For information on how to help promote civil and mutually respectful discourse and support expansion of the distribution of our programs, please email info at harbortv.com. I'm Aaron Harbor, host of The Aaron Harbor Show. You can follow the show on Twitter for instant notification of new episodes, live event invitations, outtakes, and behind the scene photos and tweet us your topic and guest suggestions today. I'm Aaron Harbour, host of The Aaron Harbour Show. I very much would like to hear from you about the program, so please send me an email with your thoughts. You can suggest what topics I should cover, what guests I should invite to be on the show, or even what specific questions you would like me to ask. This is your program, so send your suggestions to Aaron at harbortv.com. I promise to personally read every one, so email me today. And most of all, thanks for watching. Used by fire professionals around the world, Fire Ice XT Spray is an eco-friendly, easy-to-use suppressant gel designed to quickly and efficiently stop and contain all kinds of fire and heat-related events, including fiberglass, lithium batteries, and other combustibles up to 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. 
for use in your home, office, RV, fireplace, boat, kitchen, and garage. For more information on Fire Ice XT Spray, visit us online at fireice.com. Join me and watch the Aaron Harbor Show. 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 I'm Reverend Jesse Jackson. Watch the Aaron Harbor Show and keep hope alive. I'm Aaron Harbor, host of the Aaron Harbor Show. Find us on Facebook to get all the latest updates, see behind the scene photos, and make comments and ask me questions. You can see episodes before their TV broadcast, so like the show today. The Aaron Harbor Show may be viewed 24 7 at no charge from any location in the world at harbortv.com. Welcome back to the show. This is our final segment with Stuart Eisenstadt. Don't forget to read the Ambassador's book and to see part one of this special two-part series. So, Stu, I'd be really interested because you were inside the White House during the entire Iran hostage crisis. And, and reading your book, I was uh, one of the things I didn't realize were, were how many mixed signals that were sent uh, in the months, weeks, and even days leading up uh, to the, uh, the takeover of the embassy and the taking of, of hostages. Uh, it seemed like there were a lot of, of course, in retrospect, major signals saying we should be out of here. But at the same time, there were a lot of developments which seemed positive. Uh, and so I think the administration seemed to be saying, hey, we're, things are safe enough for us to stay. What happened and, and what broke down and what can we learn uh, in terms of doing a better job? Because certainly uh, we've had other situations uh, since then where we either had poor intelligence or inadequate intelligence right. or incorrect intelligence. So in my book, President Carter of the White House, years, I'm very candid about the mistakes we made in Iran. It's not fair, Aaron, to charge Carter with having lost Iran to the radicals any more than it would be to blame Eisenhower when he was president for the Cuban Revolution in 1959. But having said that, it was, in my opinion, the single worst intelligence failure in modern American history. The CIA, which had put the Shah back on the throne in 1953. By, by the way, I would disagree with you and say that the single greatest intelligence failure probably involved Iraq. Well, under, it could be the weapons. That's a close second, or at least a tie. Okay, but in, in this case, the CIA and six presidents had given the Shah of Iran tens of billions of dollars of a more sophisticated aid. He was our chief ally, and yet the CIA did not realize that the Shah's political support rested on quicksand. He had alienated large segments of the society. They didn't realize during that for five years, five years, he had been given cancer treatments for incurable cancer. They didn't know that. They didn't realize the incendiary cassettes that Khomeini was sending from Paris were having the kind of impact in fomenting the revolution. I mean, it's inexcusable. Once the hostages were taken, and there were mixed signals, because we had a rogue ambassador, Sullivan, who was saying we should reach out, reach out to Khomeini immediately, and Carter said absolutely not. But once the hostages were taken, Carter had a fundamental choice. The National Security Advisor to Carter, Brzezinski, and I both recommended immediate military action, not bombing, but blockading the harbors of Iran to keep the oil that they needed to function as a country, like Kennedy did with the Cuban Missile Crisis. Carter instead met with the hostage families and said, my number one priority is to get your loved ones back safe and sound. He did, but at huge political cost because it tied our hands for firmer action. And for 444 humiliating days, we had many agreements with the leadership of the Khomeini government each time Khomeini himself, the Ayatollah, the supreme leader, vetoed it. He hated the West. He hated Carter for supporting the Shah. And then the real coup de grace came when Carter decided on two things. First, to hold himself up in the White House, make this his prime focus, not campaign, not go abroad. And all that did is create more press attention on the hostage crisis, Ted Koppel's Nightline program, Walter Cronkite, the dean of CBS reporting, every night, day 103, day 205, day 306 of the hostage crisis. It was humiliating. And then the rescue mission. 
it was a failure not because there were too few helicopters. In fact, Carter added more than the military wanted. It was because, Aaron, there were four military services that had never coordinated before. We created afterward a joint command. It did not exist before. And so there was a catastrophic lack of cooperation on the ground at Desert One. And when the helicopter hit the rotor, hit the C-130 cargo plane, killing eight servicemen, before we even started the rush, and the flames engulfed not only those eight brave servicemen, they engulfed our administration. Well, it, it just seemed like a huge, huge policy failure and some really poor decisions on the part of the president. I think, again, a more prompt military action should have been taken, but he also should be given credit for, A, getting the hostages back, B, saving 50,000 Iranian Jews from a disaster by letting him in the country, and C, for at least trying the rescue effort. It was a very courageous effort, and but for sandstorms and some other things that came, it might have succeeded. I think it was very risky, but it was a risk that he was willing to take. But yes, we made a lot of decisions that were wrong, and he was angry at the CIA, and Stan Turner, who I interviewed, one of the 350 people I interviewed, who was our CIA director, said to me directly, we, the CIA, let the president down. We didn't give him the intelligence he needed to make the decisions he needed to make. All right, and you're talking about Admiral Stanfield? Admiral Stan Turner. Turner. Um, I want to talk about the Malay speech, uh, because uh, as you describe in your book, that speech was really a, an, a positive and upbeat speech. Uh, and you describe, and, and I thought it was fascinating, especially looking back then at how the media works compared to today with social media, um, it, it, it almost was a precursor to what can happen today in a matter of minutes on the internet. So talk about the Malay speech. So Carter comes back from a G7 summit, we had one not too long ago in Quebec that ended terribly in this administration. He comes back exhausted. He was going to give an energy speech I had drafted. He decides, I've given five energy speeches, no more. He goes to Camp David, has the best and the brightest come to try to write his administration. Then we have to give a speech. Now, wait a minute. The best and the brightest, what, what you're talking about, you described this, and I, and I think uh, the way you, you put it is accurate. He literally has a parade of America's elite come right. through to give him ideas about what, is, what would be uh, best for the country, what he exactly. should do for the country, exactly. which, which I thought in retrospect uh, didn't make him look like a great leader. No, it didn't. For 13 days we had people coming telling us what to do instead of saying, okay, I know what to do. But nevertheless, at the end of that process, he now has to give a speech. We've got the energy speech he's already canceled. He's convinced by a 29-year-old wonder king pollster Patrick Cadell that there's a great malaise in the country. And Cadell says, this is the speech you should give. Mondale, his vice president, who he gave more power to than any previous vice president, said, this is poppycock. The reason why we're unpopular is because of gas lines and inflation, not because there's some malaise in the country. We modify the malaise speech. We make it much more positive. A crisis, a confidence speech, which we can overcome by uniting on energy. The speech, Aaron, was a massive success, contrary to my thought. 17% increase in the polls in one day. And then, three days later, he decides to fire his entire cabinet to show he's in control, and all the momentum we had goes away. There was a lady in the mailroom, an older lady, who had worked since, Theodore, since FDR's days. She said all the positive mail stopped. That's amazing. All and right. Mondale almost resigned as a result. Uh, and that, that's another story that uh, we're just going to have to talk about another time. All right, that's the end of our second program with Stuart Eisenstadt. Make sure you watch the first. I'm Aaron Harbour. Thanks for watching. Please contact us. We want to hear from you. And thanks for watching.